So some researchers looked at why certain negotiators are better. They looked at hundreds of negotiations to figure out why some negotiators were good and others failed. They found that one trick led negotiators to be five times as successful. Five times as likely to reach a negotiated outcome when all looked like it was lost. What was that tip? What was that trick? Very simply, mimicking or mirroring their negotiating partner. Their partner crossed their legs, they crossed their legs as well. Their partner leaned back in their chair, they did the same. Not obviously, but subtly mimicking, mirroring what that other person was doing, made that negotiation go better. Same thing in a sales context. You go out to dinner with a waiter or waitress. Turns out if the waiter or waitress uses word for word what you ordered, so you say, I'd like a Brussels burger, medium, side salad, and a Diet Coke. Okay, the waiter says that back to you exactly. Brussels burger, side salad, sorry, medium, side salad with a Diet Coke. Word for word, they just got a 70% higher tip. By mimicking exactly what you said, they got a much higher tip. Why? Because mimicry leads to affiliation. It creates a sense of trust and a sense of liking. Right? We don't know each other. I don't know most of you, though I know a few of you. Right? But if we just met, you might not trust me. But if you find out that we have the same birthday in common, or we went to the same high school, suddenly we're part of the same tribe. We have something in common that facilitates that interaction. Mimicry turns strangers into friends and acquaintances into allies. It creates that sense of trust and affiliation. Even on first dates. Turns out first dates, if the people talk more similarly, they're more likely to go on a second date. Right? That sense of commonality, that sense of being similar, encourages future interaction. And so as we think about it to persuade others to be more influential, very simply, how can we be a chameleon? Right? Don't just listen, emulate. Take what other people are using and don't obviously do it, but push it back out to them. Someone sends you an email with, hey, your name, hi, your name, dear, your name. Try the same thing back using that little uh, salutation or whatever it is. We found the same thing actually happened uh, at, at uh, Penn recently. We had an assistant uh, in the office that nobody liked. Uh, she wasn't doing things on time, really difficult to deal with. No, nobody liked her. And then suddenly everybody thought she was much better. People were like, oh, she's great. She's turned around. And we tried to figure out why people felt that way. We started looking at her email responses. And it turned out what she was doing is if you said, hey, can you make 50 copies of this and leave it in this place? She would copy and paste that and say, yes, I can make 50 copies of this and leave it in that place. Can you make sure to turn on the lights and boot up the computer ahead of class? Yes, I can do this thing that you asked. All she was doing was copying, pasting what we said already, and it made us like her a lot more. Why? Because mimicry creates that sense of affiliation and that sense of liking. If we feel similar, whether through language or mechanisms, we have much more in common, we're much more likely to like that person as a result. So imagine again, you're out to dinner, uh, but at this time, you were about to order an entree. You're going to order the mahi-mahi. It looks delicious right on that plate up there. You are excited about it. You're ready to go. But before the waiter takes your order, they take your friend's order. Your first friend orders the steak. Your second friend orders the mahi-mahi. Now it gets to you. What are you going to do? Are you going to stick with the mahi-mahi, or might you do something different? Now, the fact that your friend ordered it, if it was information, should suggest the mahi-mahi is good. The desire to fit in should suggest that if your friend's doing it, you should fit in and order the same. And the chef still has mahi-mahi. There's no scarcity of mahi-mahi to go around. Don't worry. Yet, we would feel a little bit weird, many of us, most of us, often, about ordering the mahi-mahi. Right? About a third of the time, we'd skip the mahi-mahi, we'd pick something else, and we'd be less satisfied as a result. Because it turns out we don't just have a desire to be the same, to fit in. We also have a desire to be different, to separate ourselves from everyone else. Monkey see is not always monkey do. Right? Sometimes it's monkey see, monkey don't. So let's spend a couple minutes uh, talking about this idea uh, of differentiation. Uh, and I and like Yogi Berra quotes. They're always great. Uh, what I enjoy about them is the first time you read them, they make sense, and then you read them again, and they don't. Uh, so other than Yogi Berra pointed out, nobody goes there anymore. It's too crowded, which makes sense until you think about it for a second. How can nobody go there anymore if it's too crowded? Uh, but we have this intuition that if things are really, really popular, sometimes we don't like them anymore. But if a restaurant is too busy, if a music artist is too popular, maybe we don't like that artist or that place anymore. But it's not just extreme popularity. Sometimes even a little bit of popularity. Sometimes one other person ordering the mahi-mahi is enough to make us do something different. Because we don't just have a desire to fit in and be the same as others. We have a desire to stand out and be different. To be unique, to feel special, to feel separate from everybody else. We have what's called a need for uniqueness. Right? We don't want the same thing as everyone else. We want to feel different.